Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews, conversations with spiritually awakening people. <clears throat> We've done well over 500 of them now. And uh, if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, just go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. Um, this program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there's a PayPal button on every page of the website. Uh, my guest today is Dr. Sue Mortar. Hi, Sue. Hello there. Nice to see you, Rick. Nice to see you. I've been uh, reading your book this week. The, there it is, the, the Energy Codes, and enjoying it a lot. Um, so we'll be discussing that. Let me just read some of your bio. I might, I might skim through some of it because you're going to tell us all this stuff anyway. But um, <clears throat> Sue is a master of bioenergetic theory and quantum field visionary. I'm going to have her define those terms in a bit. She util utilizes the embodiment of high-frequency energy patterns to activate full human potential. <clears throat> through her seminars, retreats, and presentations, she illuminates the relationship of quantum science and energy medicine elevating human consciousness into life mastery. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Dr. Sue is the USA Today best-selling, number one best-selling LA Times and number one Amazon best-selling author of The Energy Codes, the book that I just held up, The Seven-Step System to Awaken Your Spirit, Heal Your Body, and Live Your Best Life. Through The Energy Codes, Dr. Sue provides techniques to activate untapped energy and neurocircuitry in the body, empower human potential, and become one's true essential self. <clears throat> um, Dr. Sue is the founder and creator of the globally taught coursework, The Energy Codes, uh, a multi-level body of work on personal and spiritual development. She also created Body Awake, um, R-Y-T, I don't know what that means, um, 200 Certified Yoga Program. What does the R-Y-T stand for? It's a registered yoga teacher. It's registered oh, yoga okay, online. that's like a PhD or like M. Yeah, yes, okay, yeah. good. Uh, and is co-creator of the Bioenergetic Synchronization Technique. She has served on professional licensing boards, providing guidance to healthcare pr practitioners on integrative approaches to healthcare leadership. She is also an adjunct faculty at two medical schools at Michigan State University, an AAU school classified as one of the top 100 universities in the world. She is the host of Gaia TV's Healing Matrix and co-host of Your Year of Miracles Lifestyle Training. She was recently uh, recognized for her outstanding achievements as an honored member of the Transformational Leadership Council. Okay, oh, there's more. <laughs> uh, I'm reading it all after all. She's, um, in addition to that, she's, she founded the Mortar Health Center, uh, Health Center in 1987 and is founder and visionary of the Mortar Institute for Bioenergetics, an organization committed to teaching individuals self-healing techniques with an inner wisdom-based approach to life based on quantum science and higher consciousness, with three distinct schools representing the unification of mind, body, and spirit. School of Energy Medicine, School of Body Awake Yoga, and School for Higher Consciousness and Personal Development. <clears throat> she provides tools and avenues to empower the global community to discover and embody a joyful, inspired life, live from true, soulful self. All right, I was going to skim that, but I kind of got into it and decided to read the whole thing. <laughs> and one thing, you know, as I'll, t I'll tell you several impressions I got from reading your book. First of all, um, you had some very profound experiences starting at a young age, which we'll be talking about. And, and you know, on the basis of that, you have evolved and designed a whole system which can help others um, experience what you've experienced or in their own way. And I really like that because a lot of times people talk from their level of experience, and people listen from their level of experience, and never the twain shall meet. You know, there's there's just not a really good <clears throat> connection. And, um, you know, some people sort of put down techniques and practices and so on. I, I've always been kind of a technique guy myself, um, and it has served me well. And I think most people do need some, some kind of practice. And uh, I'm kind of impressed by the way you've evolved a whole system of practices based on ancient wisdom, but also kind of in, in, interpreted for modern society, modern times. And judging from what I've been reading, it's been very um, 
influential and transformational for people. So that's great. There's actually a, a in difference between in Indian terminology between a rishi and a maharishi. I'm not suggesting that you're a maharishi, but but a rishi is somebody who cognizes the truth, and a maharishi is somebody who cognizes it and can impart it to others in a, in a practical way that will enable them to realize it for themselves. So I think you do that in a, in a very effective way. Oh, thank you, Rick. It, it is definitely a, um, an inborn disposition. It's, as long as I can remember, I was drawn to share whatever it was that I was knowing even prior to these illuminating experiences that began as I started meditating, I always found myself in the role of a, of a, a teaching assistant or a teacher in some fashion all, all my life. So it is definitely my purpose on the planet. Yeah, some of us are just wired to do that. Yeah. <clears throat> and actually, you know, I bet you most times when you do an interview, people start you out with um, that profound experience you had when you were in a big group meditation and you hovered above the earth and all that. We'll, we'll get to that. But actually, you started having things much earlier. For instance, in your book, you talk about um, when you were six years old, you were playing in a creek bed and you had some profound experience. Could you elaborate on that one? Yes. I, well, I, we had a creek right across the street from our house in a pasture where my father had cattle and it just had a few cows, and I would always go over there and just kind of hang out. And so I, I was reaching forward in, in the base of the creek bed, climbing down in there, and this golden shimmering light was glistening off the surface of the water as sun reflects. And as I reached forward, so I was kind of messing with these little tadpoles that were that were just hatching and birthing, and some of them were, you know, swimming about. And I was just fascinated with that process in a state of really wonder and kind of awe struck. And I, I mentioned that because I, I now think in retrospect that, that those vibrational frequencies of wonder and awe are a significant peace. They're a significant ingredient in our ability to pierce through veils and live in a multidimensional realm. So this is what happened for me then. At the time, I didn't have any context for it, but I remember reaching my hand forward with this little stick to just kind of toss around the, the, the leaves and such. And and this glowing off the surface of my hand was more pronounced than the shimmering of the water underneath it. And I could see that when I would move, this entire energy field, this radiance would move along with my movements. And if I started to think about, I wonder if I move my hand that way, and that's all the further I got in my mind, the field would kind of go that way and nearly carry my hand with it. It wasn't that, you know, when I when I was watching it, it wasn't that I was moving and then this energy field would come after. It was almost this intentional field that was ca causing or directing the physical action. Now, I wasn't a scientist. I certainly wasn't trained at the time, but but I was very aware of what was happening there. And it it had my attention. And I then started noticing that I could see energy fields around people and uh, pets and, you know, anything that was even the animals. Then I, I grew up on a farm. And so the cows would have this, the horses would have this energy field around them that I was constantly marveling over. So, yeah. And, um, and you thought at the time that everybody saw that, you know, and you yeah, eventually yeah. discovered that they didn't. Yes, it, I would talk about it. You know, what's that yellow thing that follows Dad around when he's talking? And what's that? What's that orange thing coming off the cows? And and you know, my parents, their eyes would get big, and they'd kind of look at each other. And and so I, little by little, pieced together, especially when I went to school, that people weren't talking about these kinds of things. And I consciously remember, um, or I remember consciously shutting it down, just thinking. I'm making these people uncomfortable, and that's making me uncomfortable. And so I'm not going to do this thing. I'm not, I'm just, I guess that's not what we do. 
So yeah. almost the way we learn about manners and the, the you know, a, 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 a decorum, a, a way of functioning in society. It was, it had that kind of feeling to it. I just kind of corralled it. And uh, to the point that I actually then later wasn't able to retrieve it uh, as maybe 10 or 15 years later, I wanted to get that back. And I never could until many years later when I had you know, these meditation experiences that started to light things up and suddenly that, that returned. But in those interim years, I pretty much wondered if I'd been imagining it or making it up and because I couldn't get it back. And it was like, gosh, I was young, you know, maybe, maybe that wasn't really real. And then, you know, lo and behold, it, it reinstated, restored itself um, many years later, probably 20. Yeah. I've interviewed quite a few people who, you know, the reason I'm interviewing them is that they've now had some kind of spiritual blossoming. And, um, but who say that they had the kind of stuff you're talking about when they were about that age, you know, six, five, and um, sometimes experiencing like, you know, auras or angels or, or feeling like they were in unity consciousness or something. And then as they got a little older, it started to slip away, whether they wanted it to or not. Uh, and then they went through their crazy teenage years and so on. And then often the, the usual pattern is toward the end of their teens or early 20s, they begin to want to rediscover that, you know, and find out what that was. Yeah. And, uh, and then that gets them going and eventually it unfolds. But, you know, my theory is that, um, and like, let's hear yours too, is, is that, you know, we come into this life at different levels of consciousness or different levels of evolution. And it's not surprising that people who had some kind of profound spiritual awakening a little bit later in life um, were fairly highly evolved as children. And, uh, you know, it just took a little while to mature. Definitely. I definitely know that I, I picked up where I left off. I came in um, very lucid. I didn't, uh, I couldn't reconcile how what I was knowing, even though I wasn't articulating it, there was a knowing. And when I didn't meet with that same realm, reality, in front of me, the people, the places, the circumstances didn't match vibrationally what I, what I really perceived as real, I began to question, you know, something's awry here, something's discordant, and I, as I now feel the soul is going to do uh, for purposes of its own refinement and polishing, uh, I, I questioned myself rather than, than grounding in that and revealing it outwardly into into the world now uh, we have we we have knowings and and stories of of those that have been able to sustain that and come out teaching at 11 and 12 and 14 years old who have made you know tremendous inroads in our spiritual history um however i you know i receded inward and uh and sh and just kind of sheltered that and developed a way of being in the outer world that was very hesitant and questioning of the self and translated that into shyness or intimidation and 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 such and so what i know is that in in the years since then the people that i've been working with that have felt you know suppressed or have felt hesitant in life or had been one of the quiet ones in the corner most of their life they actually when we start tapping that and and inquiring about this deeper knowing they can access it pretty readily and uh, once given permission to i you know connect the dots connect some circuitry on that and start presenting you know, representing it um, to the surface of their lives they start finding that they have you know quite a tremendous transformation in in a relatively short period of time because it was it was sitting there just waiting to be tapped and that tapping can't happen until it can and and as it does we start rec recognizing just recognizing this this true self that is um, our birthright so Yes, I do. You mentioned earlier about different levels of consciousness and different levels of operation for different people. 
And I do feel that that some of us are not here doing that at this time, that we're here getting our feet wet and really grounding ourselves in the physical. And this is the person that, in my experience, you know, just doesn't really want to have anything to do with a conversation about spirituality and, and this deep inquiry. They're really more, you know, rubber meets the road, give me something tangible and physical to, to work with. And I feel that they are also on the same path. They're just focusing in a very anchoring, grounding, you know, phase of it. And uh, and are doing their spiritual practice in their own way. It just looks different than than it does, you know, to to someone who is is operating with it on a conscious cognitive level. Sure, Saint Teresa of Avila said it, it appears that God Himself is on the journey. So I would say that everything from amoebas to God <laughs> is on the journey. It's on and, the journey, yes. And obviously, you know, every, all beings are just at different stages of it. Um, but there's this evolutionary current that we more or less flow along with. And um, at one point, a few minutes ago, you said you came in where you left off, or you started in where you left off, which implies reincarnation, which I think you and I both are totally comfortable with. But the idea there is that, you know, whatever level of consciousness we achieve in a particular lifetime, <clears throat> and, you know, then this vehicle no longer becomes sustainable, we pick up a new vehicle and, and we pretty much pick it up, you know, continue from where we left off. Yes, yes. And that, that so then people will ask often, does that mean that you believe in past lives? And and I kind of play with that and say, well, actually, no. And then it's confusing because we're talking about, you know, multiple experiences, etc. And, and I say that I really feel that there's one life that we're constantly living and that we, well, that's a good way of putting we it. <laughs> move into this ex- physical expression and then we move out of it and then in and then out and in and out. But But the life itself never stops. And so... It's comforting for someone to kind of recognize, oh, okay, so I'm actually not going to die, and, uh, you know, a wonderful thing to uh, to perceive. That's a nice way of, of explaining it, you know, because obviously saying past lives makes it sound like life somehow stopped and then yeah. started again, and what you're saying is that life is a continuum, but it just kind of goes in and out of different expressions or different forms. Yes, so I would be alive here, and then I would be alive elsewhere, and then I would be alive here, and then I would be yeah. alive elsewhere. And it, I always feel this like sigh of relief in the room when when we start speaking about it that way. It's like something connects in the in the consciousness and the subconsciousness of the of the group of people, and um, and and it has it has uh, it has tied together many life experiences that I have had and memories that I have of having been here you know, before. So. Yeah. At what age in this life or this expression or whatever we want to call it, did you kind of decide to, I mean, did you consciously start seeking again? Like in your twenties or something? Uh, Yes, there, there was a, my parents were both, uh, were very interesting people. My father was a pioneer in energy medicine. He was very interested in how do people heal when they heal? Why don't they when they don't? It was it was all you know nature based and working with the nervous system and the electromagnetism of the body and so forth. And and my father, my mother was very into um, astrology and and uh, spiritual psychology and just very curious about all of that. So I grew up inside of those kinds of conversations and influences, even when I was too young to understand it, the energetic was there, you know, the backdrop was there. And so I actually was very curious in around 10 and 11 and 12 and 13, uh, I can I can remember looking in between the lines and wondering what what it was all about and watching the crowd in school do what they did and and um, being you know shy and and kind of hiding I observed a lot so I could see patterns and trends and tendencies and I was I was it was you know it was a curiosity that I now consider to be the the beginnings of me pursuing this path on a on a more conscious level, um, and so I was drawn to books that would that would describe it, but not so much a spiritual tradition. It was more of of the um, the the science of it and the the possibility of you know thought and beliefs and creation of reality in those terms. And so it was later when. 
when it became part of more of a spiritual tradition and the, the way I entered into meditation, which isn't the way that everyone does. Some people, you know, just go into to working with mindfulness and meditation from that perspective, and some people go into to that world as a devotee and, uh, and working with teachers and the passing down of traditions and such. And, and that happened to be the way that it uh, literally unfolded in, in my life. And I do feel that that played a role in my ability to open to the things that I did eventually open to and continue to open to uh, because of this this heart-based devotional piece, I feel that the energetic of the devotion itself and the, the role of honoring and reverie and reverence and sacredness, those frequencies in my uh, my being, my awareness and my heart connected to my attention and and the consistency and the willingness to do whatever it took to do right by the teaching or the teacher, that that peace played a role for me that caused the heart to be infused into the efforts, if you will, for lack of a better word in this moment, um, of putting intention on the meditative peace that had I just tried to sit and meditate, which I actually had tried a few times prior, uh, nothing, nothing would, nothing happened for me. And, and yet when I, when I was kind of swept into this world where there were teachers and ceremony and sacred ritual kind of thing that was beautiful and, and enhancing this heart-based world, something very different happened very quickly, almost instantaneously for me. When the heart and the mind seemed to be so infused together, it gave a different quality to stilling my mind and allowing for something to, um, to, to be accessible that, that I had not been able to tap before. That's great. Do you mind saying what this group was that you... Um, there, there was, I, I really can't because as I got into it further, I found that, that some, there was, there was a lack of integrity in some things that were happening. And I, unfortunately, in the, in the course of the original years that I started teaching, I never shared the names, but I shared some of the stories because it was paramount to me that integrity be part of everything that was happening when the, in the groups that started gathering around me. And it became just like, you know, we can do this, but, but it has to be like this and this and this in order for me to be comfortable bringing this realm forward for people. And so some of the stories of points of reference or relativity uh, by example uh, of going and collecting monies to build to, to build kitchens in India that I later would find that the monies weren't being used for that at all, but, you know, were personal real estate purchases and things like that. That that was just not okay. But because I had already told the stories, I really didn't feel good because, because there was also so much good that happened in my life that I never want to do harm to the individual and the individuals that were running this organization because it was such a gift in my life. But there were also these pieces that were just not in alignment. And so I, um, I just have always protected it at the same time, you know, um, being, being real about, about what, is, what is significant and important to me. That's great. I could almost say the very same words about what I went through, um, you know, tremendous benefit and tremendous gratitude for all that. But then again, some things out of integrity. And in fact, I think that experience was part of what inspired me to sort of get on this integrity bandwagon a little bit. Um, a few years ago with a few friends, uh, we, we formed something which initially we called the Association for Professional Spiritual Teachers, but then changed the name to the Association for Spiritual Integrity. And we have an organization, a lot of people have joined it. <clears throat> and uh, because there is so much um, lack of integrity in the spiritual world, and it's unfortunate because I think, as you would agree, that you know, 
spirituality in its pure form has a tremendous gift to offer the world and is perhaps the most critical and fundamental um, leverage or, or influence of world events, but it gets sabotaged or hamstrung when representatives of it um, are out of integrity and it, and, and the people who have been studying with them get totally disillusioned, sometimes thrown off the path for who knows how long. And so it really needs to sort of I mean, no one's in a position to police the whole thing, but, but you know, the, the appreciation for integrity, I think, the more it can be enlivened in the, the collective consciousness of spiritual seekers and, and the more they can, you know, hold their own teacher's feet to the fire if, if the teacher is going off the beam, the, the more healthy the whole and, uh, thing will be and the more effective it'll be in, pr in producing social change. Yes, there's such a purity that is so powerful and all one has to do is walk that, and and it unfolds magnificently, automatically, because the power of the universe is behind it, and we're not thwarting it or distorting it by having some better idea than how how you know reality would would just have things be, and so um, so it is. It's always been a wonder to me how how it is. There's so much power put into um, the energetics that are discordant and kind of, kind of in a distortion of sorts. And there's so much uh, it, um, initial power that appears, but ultimately it, it will never be sustainable. And so I always marvel about, about that. And I've, I've made it a, a personal um, kind of disposition, just kind of quietly along the way, just curious about how far would just integrity take me? You know, how... How far would it go if I, if I, you know, how many people could I reach? How, how many, how many people could be touched? How many lives could be enhanced if, if all I ever did was just walk the authentic path? And when people would come forward and say, you need to do this, everybody's doing this in order to build your business or this is happening. And if I didn't feel it, I was like, you know, thank you, no. Um, and a few times I truly trusted some of the people and I would try it and it just, it, you know, was, it was never out of integrity, but it wasn't, it wasn't a heartfelt thing for me. It was just more of an, uh, an intellectual analytical process and it would never work for me. And, and I, I quickly learned, you know, my path is just to just walk, just walk this and see, see what unfolds, see what happens and see where your life takes you. And uh, I knew that this awakening that was, you know, starting 20 years ago with me and these things were just unfolding literally, visually and experientially, that that there was a reason and I didn't didn't know exactly in, in you know on this conscious level exactly what I was supposed to do with it, but I knew that that it it was significant enough that my life needed to be about that. And uh, and so that's what it has that's how it has unfolded and and has us speaking here today. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, and there's some nice examples of that in your book. Um, <clears throat> I liked what you said just now and also a few minutes ago about the the head and the heart both being involved. And for you, that, that really worked. And, um, you know, I, if... I've said this before on this show, but I, I don't like to use the word enlightenment because it has this static superlative connotation. But if... Um, if I were to use it, I, I would want it to refer to people who are very holistically developed, you know, intellect, heart, senses, you know, the whole, all the different facets of our makeup. Um, and very often you see lopsided development. Ken Wilber talks about lines of development that can get very out of sync with one another. Um, but I really think it's essential for our own well-being and the safety of our journey and our influence on the world that we somehow achieve a, a holistic development. Definitely. You know, this is one of the first things that I, that I noticed when I came into this, this world where there were teachers, who were teaching and healers that were healing from this spiritual context. And having come out of natural health care, I was very, you know, trained up on and had grown up inside of this world where 
where the body had the ability to heal itself and our thoughts and our emotions had an influence on that and and and, and all of this was kind of working in a collaborative fashion and so my my come from if you will was just was just that was very holistic in its uh, in its own right at that time and and then I started you know meditating and almost instantly these openings started occurring for me and so I was drawn to teachers I couldn't get enough of it when I would you know would would just sit down in a room with people who were meditating and 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 you know a teacher was was translating information I knew all of it that was coming out was exactly the truth and and what I was here to be reminded of and it was it was my time to you know just drink this up and yet I would notice that oftentimes there was ex- extreme obvious health issues or extreme habitual things in their lifestyle that were really out of context for me. It didn't make sense to me because I thought, number one, speaking again of the integrity piece, I thought that you had to be an integrity, be a good person, you know, be taking care of yourself and eating certain ways and, and I don't know, exercising and those kinds of things that were that were in my mind at the time appropriate for vitality in, in human form. And and here I was coming across, you know, quite quite a, a, a different arrangement, a, di- a different you know collection of of obvious priorities. And um, and then I started realizing, and I started asking, and and one of the the teachers said to me, "If I'm a thief and I become enlightened, I'm an enlightened thief. You don't have to be an in integrity." And and I I. Um, you know that was that was kind of close to the moment that I started parting parting you know ways and kind of moving in a different direction. But but I was I was also just it was striking to my heart space that that someone that could be helping this is a, another individual who is a healer and and I would see people flock by the hundreds or the thousands to this individual that that was healing healing people in these great rooms with, you know, um, just a tremendous high pristine energy that's so evident, but yet there was, you know, just such an extraordinary um, lack of vital force in this, in the body of this person who was, who was doing this. And, um, and where did all that pristine energy come from if there was this lack of vital force? Running, running rooms of people that were holding the space for the work to be done. And so the group itself was yes, creating that yes, energy, but this yes. guy was We're not, um, not. Yeah. However, was was you know had these 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 gifts or these talents, these cities that were moving energies in ways that most people cannot, and it just had my attention. I was just captivated by it, um, and also disheartened by you know the integration piece not being there, and. Interestingly, and not, I can't say that that was causal to why my interest became what it was, but, but simultaneously my interest in integrating these experiences that I was starting to have in these higher realms, I became very interested in being able to repeat these on command, right? And so my mind, trained the way it was, is that I had to do it to get there. I had to figure out what I was doing that allowed me to get there. And and after many years, figured out it was not the doing, it was the undoing, the not doing, that allowed that opening to be present and, and for me to become aware of it. Um, and, and so what I recognized in those years was that I had to be more in my body and I had to be more integrated myself in order to have access to being able to tap these frequencies on on a regular basis to be able to to sit and and sense my way into that to perceive this stillness required more grounding for me and so embodiment became a focus of mine just it developed itself. It just kind of birthed itself as a realization that in order for me to tap these realms that I had shot up into, just opened up into, in order for me to have access on a regular basis, it required not efforts of this enlightenment, as you're speaking of it, um, but really more 
focus on embodiment, grounding myself, coming into the body, coming into the wisdom energies, coming into the having frequencies rather than the wanting frequencies, and coming into the loving presence rather than the trying, efforting, seeking um, channels. And so, so landing in the body more in more ways is how I started interpreting. I started sensing that, wow, I'm actually more here, and that's what allows me to be there, and there becomes here when I do that. So, so it, it started to change my perception. Now, I, I hadn't joined these meditation groups um, because I was seeking enlightenment. I didn't even know about enlightenment. I actually began participating in it in an, in an attempt for stress relief. I, I was drawn to meditation for stress relief. And I met someone who was already in a, you know, in the ten in the, the groups of meditating and and they took me there and and in the midst of that relationship I found myself in the face of of these meditation retreats, etc. And it was really for the relationship that I was doing it, um, as much as it was for stress relief, learn to meditate, just where I was coming from at the time. And and so in in the midst of that, I started having these these openings. And I'm so grateful that I didn't know that this idea of enlightenment was a goal to pursue because I was very goal-oriented at that point in my life, and I would have started pursuing it to the degree that I know I would have never, I would have never allowed myself, I, I, I can't say never, but I have a tendency to believe that I would have it made it harder on myself when I was, if, because I would have taken it on as a project. I have, to, I have to get this done. I have to accomplish this. I have to do this. And I didn't even really know that it was something to you know, accomplish or achieve. It, 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 it never has felt like that to me. And, and I think had I perceived it as such, I, I might have gotten lost in the pursuit and dialed into so much trying and efforting that I might, it might have taken me longer to ever sit down and relax and allow uh, and not do um, rather than, than how I had accomplished the other things in my life that I you know, had accomplished. So. Yeah, some good points in there. Um, first of all, I think st- stress relief is a perfectly legitimate reason to get involved in meditation or yoga or something like that. Sometimes people criticize it and you know say, "Oh, it's just superficial and worldly or whatever." But um, why not? You know, it's nothing. Stress relief is a good thing. Uh, stress relief, and um, and next thing you know, you're having beautiful, profound experiences. So if whatever gets you started, you know. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, I totally agree. Yeah. And, and this thing about them. grounding, I think, is really good, too. Um, reminds me of an old Stephen Wright joke where he said, uh, said, I broke up with my girlfriend because I wasn't really into meditation and she really wasn't into being alive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, a lot of times um, people get, it's like, it's like a, a sh- you know how a sailboat has to have a big heavy keel down beneath the water in order to not tip over. Yes. And sometimes people people don't establish that keel in their in their life, and um, they can get very top heavy and very sort of airy fairy and, and ungrounded. And um, it's that's not what you're looking for. I mean, you really want an integrated development um, in which you can you know have your Maybe have your head in the clouds, but also have your feet on the ground and and span the the distance between them. Exactly. Yes, I completely concur. You know the analogy of the roots in the tree. The tree yeah. can't really grow taller without deepening the roots and right or the uh, foundation of a skyscraper or whatever. Yes, yes. And I love the keel in the sailboat. I love to sail. It's one of my one of oh, my nice. loves in life. And and appreciating working with collaborating with nature and the forces of nature, the wind and the water and, you know, that the power that you can feel when you're integrating those, uh, those elements at the same time. And that's really what we're speaking about. Yeah. So you've alluded to these experiences you started having. Let's, let's get into some of those. Like you had this real Lollapalooza experience on <laughs> some retreat where you're in the, talk, talk about that. <laughs> sure. So I, um, I had been kind of drawn into this community that we spoke of earlier, and I was pulled in closely, quickly, to um, the the teacher, 
and was serving as a as personal assistant very quickly, just to do, you know, like blink, blink. And, uh, and I was also, my disposition in life was to serve, to give, to kind of overgive and to always be trying to do the right thing and help out. And, and it was a little outside of the self, the degree to which that I was functioning that way. And, and, um, and perhaps this, this teacher was on to that and gave me a list of things to do that were impossible to do in the amount of time that I was given to do them. And so I was running around behind the scenes at this retreat, taking care of all sorts of things and, um, you know, making sure this and monitoring that and going and purchasing this for this and just, you know, literally running around in the back hallways with sweat running down my back to try to make this this experience beautiful for 300 people that were sitting in the ballroom with the music playing and the candles lit and, you know, the draperies blowing in the breeze. And it was, you know, I would go past the door on my way on one of my errands and, and realize, you and know, you're actually a member of this retreat. You just got kind of drawn into all this work, right? I was, to, <laughs> I was paying to do the work. Paying to do that, yeah, this wasn't very right. So I and I and I realized that, and and this one, this one particular moment, I it hit me. I was like, I looked at the list, and I looked at the, you know, and I looked in the door and saw these people having a beautiful time, and and I, you know, it just landed for me, and I said, you know, I'm. You know, I said actually a couple of explicitives in in a uh, very graphic form that got the job done, and you know, cut through something in my own consciousness, and uh, you know, a couple of words, and uh, and I threw the list away and walked into the room, and you know, just said, I'm just going to go have me a meditation. You know, I'm just <laughs> by golly. And so I sat down, and and I was I was new to the whole thing. I didn't understand Sanskrit. They were chanting Sanskrit terms, and it was Om Namah Shivaya, and it was the slowest version of that that you could imagine. And I wasn't used to singing or you know letting anything come out of my mouth like that. And I would have thought of it as singing. Singing at the time, that's that's where I was. And so um, so I had to. I sat down, and and they were they were holding these tones longer than I could because I was a very shallow breather and a perfectionist trying to compensate for my shyness in the world and you know just overcoming the overcoming and uh and so holding these tones i had to concentrate with all all that i had everything that i had which i think was an important ingredient in the moment and sanskrit tones you know om namah shivaya making these sounds that that are obviously opening and and creating frequencies inside the system that have a stilling effect on the mind and an, an enlivening effect on the on the on the essence on the energy system beneath and um, and I was having to breathe slower than I ever breathe, and I was having to take deeper breaths than I normally would um, in order to just stay in tandem and do the right thing with everybody around me that was chanting the right way, and I was trying to learn how to do that. And so um, in that, also another ingredient, another active ingredient maybe, um, was that I was, you know, I was staking a claim for myself. I was like, you know, I'm not going to go do this thing that I always do of taking care of everybody else. I'm going to go just sit down and do something for me. And it wasn't my general come from in life. It was not, it was not, a, it was a, it was something I had to consciously learn how to do. So this was a moment where that was starting to, to find a balance. And so these ingredients were all there and the collective, the group energy was there and and I got through a few rounds of this Om Namah Shivaya, and boom, I, I disappeared into another realm. I was in a light so brilliantly bright, it was ten times brighter than the brightest day in the desert that I had ever seen. And I could see 360 degrees around, above, below, everything in a sphere. I could just, I could see it all instantly. And I could perceive the earth i could see the earth beneath me it was about the size of a marble and i was me but i wasn't in a body i was embedded into the earth up to what felt like it would have been my knees but i didn't have knees i was just this ray of light this golden citrine kind of colored ray of of conscious light and this brilliant light above this horizon uh, and the bright light below the horizon uh, and every time I took a breath, this horizon was this pink, beautiful, iridescent, translucent blanket of light that would rise up on my inhale as I was chanting, 
and would drop to back to its resting place on my exhale. And with each inhale, like these giant wings of a stingray just swimming in slow motion under the oceans, what it looked like behind me, beside, in front, everything equal. And I knew that this brilliant light overhead was becoming love as it passed through my own system and that I was breathing love down this ray to the earth. And I knew in that instant that that is what we are. That's the only thing that's happening, that we are transmuting light into love and creating an existence here in this physical dimension. And uh, I had free will in this moment because I could choose to breathe big or small, And this blanket would respond in accordance with that. And I knew that the degree to which we allow ourselves to breathe freely is proportional to the amount of light that is being transduced into love um, in in our systems. And um, I don't know how long I was there in this in that initial moment, but when I dropped back into my body and knew that I was sitting here in this room and could hear people chanting. Uh, I opened my eyes and I was looking from a different place than I was looking from when I initially closed them. And I happened to to look to the front of the room, and the, the teacher was sitting there, eyes locked right on me with this huge smile with, you know, like, got you, you know, like, I got you. And I was like, yes, 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 you got you. That had me completely. And um, there was so much bliss and, and so much um, emanation of an exalted divine presence. Uh, As I was in this body, I could feel the radiance again that I could had seen when I was a kid in the creek bed. I could see it emanating off of my own face and my hands and, and everyone else and could once again see these energies in the spaces between the people that were in the room with me. And um, I knew that my life was was changed forever in that I now had a reference point that was was my new baseline that everything would be relative to. And I'll just add briefly to this that in in the days that followed, you know, there were a tremendous there was a tremendous time of integration after that for me. It was it was a, a big challenge to try to pick up on in the life that I'd been living prior. Um, But one of the things that I noticed that is so interesting to me um, is that when I would look at people in the room with me, they would look like a photograph. You know the difference between if you pick up a photograph of someone versus sitting right, you know, next to them and seeing the 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 3D version of them versus the two-dimensional version of them in a photograph, how this looks so flat, that people walking around in this world looked as flat as a photograph relative to the multiple dimensional per- perception that m- the field had, my field had been, you know, exposed to or awakened to in some way. And it was, uh, it was quite interesting for me to try to navigate how close I was to someone, where they were and where they were not, um, because of just trying to recalibrate, seeing through this energy field and just seeing differently dimensionally uh, after that. Let's talk about Let's talk more about the days and weeks after that big experience. In your book, you said that um, it took you about a week before you had integrated that energy enough so that you could sit and stand and walk around. Um, So what was happening in that week before you could even do those things? Yes, I was laying in a bed, and I didn't care if I ever ever opened my eyes and came out of that bed because were you still on the retreat at this point i was in well what happened was um i i came back you know just clamped down got home from the retreat and 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 as i got back from the retreat 
people were waiting for me at the airport because they had heard that I had this experience. And the message on the other end was, don't let her get on a plane. And I didn't get the message. I caught a 5 a.m. flight. And, you know, so it was all that I could do. Someone was flying with me, but I was just, you know, muscling up the, sim- the same effort putting into that. I remember feeling like I, if I was trying to lift like a dumbbell with 150 pounds on it, that much effort that you would put into that in your, in your physicality, I was having to like walk with trying to contain myself in a body or I would just bliss out and get lost at the airport, which I was this, did. Were you in India when this happened? You were have, having to come back from India? No, I was in the United States. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and so when I got home, uh, there were people there at the airport helping me get to the house, and, and boom. You know, when I, when I lay down in my bed, I just let go. I was able to just let go again. And there was this beautiful woman who, who would wake me up every, you know, a couple times a day and, and give me something to eat that they were, you know, the teacher and some of the assistants were recommending and making sure that I was drinking water. And, and I would be just like, like I was drunk, like I was completely drugged or just totally blissed out. And uh, it wasn't, I wasn't, you know, I, hadn't, I don't, I haven't ever taken anything, you know, psychotropic or psychedelic in that way. And so, so there, I would lay there in this bliss. And then as I would try, I would feel somebody touching my body, trying to, you know, stir me. And I would have to compress myself is what it felt like, just squeeze myself into this place, this presence here. And um, and it would be blissful, but vibrating, just so much vibration. And, you know, as each day would pass, I, I was just, I would be out all day, all night, just in this, in these realms where uh, there was, there was nothing, or there would be, you know, a, kind of a cosmic kind of feeling similar to what we see when we look at that nebulae and, you know, stardust and these cosmic clouds that we look at when we look at, you know, astronomy and photography of outer space. And sometimes it would be like that and filled with colors or sounds, but it was all just, uh, you know, now I, I have a greater context for those things. But at the time it was just, you know, a blissful uh, swirl of everything and nothingness. And, uh, and then I got a call from the teacher about four or five days later and, you know, and they held up the phone for me and, and I just remember hearing, it's time for you to ground these energies. It's just really time for you to ground this. And so, um, the encouragement was to get into a salt bath and, and, you know, just start moving my body and that type of thing. And so, uh, that's, that's what I did with a little help from my friends and, you know, got, got that in. Now, then as soon as I started doing that, things began to integrate enough. I could walk around the house and, you know, but I didn't, I didn't want to hear music, radio, people talking, the television, forget about it. It felt so invasive and so intense to my system that had just been, uh, you know, just opened up into such an expansive state. And, uh, and I went to work maybe a week later, half day, and would just go into my treatment room and, and work with my patients, and uh, and they would leave, and another one would come in, and I would just kind of park myself uh, for the several weeks to come, and uh, you know we would laugh about the patients knew what was was happening. You know, many of them knew what was going on, and and they were they were happy to you know make their way into the treatment room themselves instead of being greeted and you know handled normally because they they would they would joke about. You know, just being in the room with you at this point is is going to be, you know, a session for me, and uh, just just learning how to, you know, do the doing of life again was fine, but it was very obvious to me the harshness that we have ad- adopted and adapted as the norm baseline uh, inside of our human existence. The 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 energies that we have learned that we tolerate that we tune out so many uh, layers of our reality in order to function in our world that it is not a wonder it's not a wonder it's no wonder that that people have a hard time you know dropping back down into that state of presence that is the true self um, without the help of the body 
it was it was the embodiment piece that allowed me to to find my way here in this world um, with the buffering and the the filtering that the body itself does. Um, bringing my awareness into the body was the saving grace. Was what allowed me to not only become functional again, but but really I found super functional. I became much more capable, um, much more energy, much more endurance, much more vitality, and much more capacity to perceive, you know, what what was necessary, what was appropriate, who we are, what's going on here. Uh, there was a level of discernment that just came forward without an effort, all because I, I felt like I was in my body for the first time in my life, and, uh, and that the body was contributing to the ability to translate this really cosmic proportion of, uh, you know, intelligence that we are. So... That's pretty cool. As you were speaking, I was kind of thinking of that line, that, that scene in When Harry Met Sally where Meg Ryan is having this experience at the table with Billy Crystal, and then someone at the next table says, I'll have what she's having. <laughs> Whatever that is. <laughs> right. um, but it's, it's really interesting. And, um, you know, like you say, when you finally integrated this thing, the amount of energy that you found that you had and that you still have was orders of magnitude above what it had been before this. And, you know, if you've ever, people who have ever encountered a sort of a, one of these great beings like Ama, whose picture I have over my shoulder or something like that, you think, how does she do it? You know, I mean, how does she sit there for literally for 24 hours without getting off the couch, hugging 150,000 people or something like that, where did they, without dropping dead and, and still looks really bright when she gets up, even more so maybe. So there's this, you know, I mean, I know you like to talk about physics and stuff. I mean, physicists say that at the level of the vacuum state, there's more potential energy, unexpressed energy, than in a, in a cubic centimeter than there is in the whole manifest universe at, at, the, at a more superficial level. And we are, you know, whatever the vacuum state or the unified field or anything may be, we are that. I mean, it, it's our essence as well as the essence of everything else, and so ultimately that's what we are. And um, it seems that realizing that, is, is tantamount to tapping into that energy and being able to be a conduit for it to whatever extent this body can can handle it. And obviously, initially, it was maybe too much to handle for you, but then you have you you adapted to it. You you know you adjusted to it, and the rest has been cruising along for you. It's been uh, amazing. I, I've oftentimes described it as. People ask me, how do you do what you do? How do you do that? You, you, I used to be on a plane, you know, two or three times a week, flying different cities, constantly doing, and then just stepping in and teaching all day for five, six, seven days in a row. And at the end of it, I could begin again. It, it, it's always that way. And uh, how do you do that? Where do you get the energy? And it's, it's like my, my knee-jerk response was, I'm not using my energy. It's I mean, it ultimately is mine, it's ours, but it's not this separate self, this isolated entity that's having to generate my own energy. It's like I borrow it, I utilize it, I give it back, I try to, you know, improve upon it as I can, as I'm, you know, expressing in the world, and, and I just get some more and give it back again, and it just literally feels like an open channel, and, you know, that's become a part of the teaching of you know, the techniques types of approach that I utilize is to just to teach people to start perceiving themselves as this open channel that is uh, receiving and utilizing and then, you know, releasing and receiving and utilizing and giving it back so that that we're not walking around trying to muster up the gumption or find the energy to have to do something. Now, I will say that the more analytical thinking one does, the harder it is to do that. So, so we do have to cultivate this, this sense of presence and observation and just kind of kicking it into neutral and being here in order for that to be able to happen consistently. Yeah. And not only, I mean, as you say in your book, um, not only are most people not tapped into this amazing energy, but um, also perhaps because of that, um, 
they their whole system, mind and body, function very inefficiently. So there's a, a lot of mental chatter that doesn't contribute to anything and uh, corresponding physiological agitation that, that is not an efficient way to function. So we not only do we not have that infinite access to that infinite energy, but we're consuming a lot of the energy we do have with um, fruitless activities, mental and physical. Absolutely. People have no idea how much energy they consume by trying to weigh out their options and being trapped in indecision and, and writing stories about people's intentions or, or predicting their future or regretting their past. There is so much energy consumed in those uses of the mind that that energy then is not available to be felt and perceived in a strong enough concentration that they could then channel it into this this toric field flow that that you know that I'm speaking about that that became obvious to me that my system was running on so they can't ever perceive the energy flowing through their system because it's so dissipated into these mental activities and these emotional consumptions and regrets and remorses and you know all of that that spinning our that wheels it, it disperses it yes it's spinning the wheels and it's just flying off of us instead of containing it and holding it and having it and appreciating it and feeling it so that the sensory nervous system can start to perceive it and appreciate it you know if once people start being able to feel the energy that they truly are the sensory m- nervous system the mind can can perceive it and and it can develop an appreciation for it which then magnifies it and makes it even more robust and uh, and obvious to us and then it becomes something we can work with and and something that we don't we choose easily choose not to overthink a situation because we can feel it robbing our energy we choose not to you know predict or analyze or 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 write a story about something because we feel our energy being consumed outwardly and now not available to utilize in the ways that that we came here to utilize it, you know, that that we came here to awaken to it. Yeah. There's a verse in the Gita which goes, um, for many branched and endlessly diverse are the intellects of the irresolute, but the resolute intellect is one-pointed. And it always reminds me of sort of like a, a bicycle wheel where, you know, ordinarily people's attention are scattered like the spokes in every direction. And they're, they're out on one or another spoke kind of just jumping around without any center. But, you know, the resolute intellect, someone who is established there is more like the hub and, you know, can just, the hub doesn't actually move much compared to the spokes. The spokes are going around like this. The hub is just in more silent space. And, uh, but it, from its perspective, you know, it, it hasn't sort of gone out and gotten lost on one spoke or another. It's it's kind of the source of, or, or basis or, or literally the hub of all the spokes. Yes. And, uh, you know, so if we can function from there, obviously our, uh, you know, our activity can be much more efficient because we're not literally not scattered. And we can sense in an instant if it's worth my attention or not. If yeah. we don't leave home, if we're here, but we roll our attention out there and look, but I'm still sitting here instead of me going over there to that thing, but staying on the self and observing, then we can tell in an instant if that's something that is really a vibrational frequency that I, that I am, am, does it match? Does it match the real me? That, because we can maintain that reference point. But if we go, if we throw all of our attention over there onto the outer edge of the spoke, if you will, uh, we're over there on the object instead of on the self. We're, we're now out there in the relative. And it's really tough to, to maintain a, 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 a reference point of self when we're completely caught up in the movie, where we're really caught up out there in the material world, in the manifest. Yeah, another element of it, which you, I noted from your book, is that you after this big breakthrough, you had a lot more um, kind of what we might call supportive nature. Things were just kind of working out for you in, in really interesting ways. Uh, one might almost say miraculous. And also, you already referred to the intuition. And, you know, one quick comment on that is, you know, I, I do think, and you probably agree, that there's a kind of a, an all-pervading intelligence that orchestrates the universe. And if we actually become one with that, 
um, even though we may not know everything. That's not humanly possible. But um, residing there, uh, then that intelligence which is orchestrating everything orchestrates things for us. Uh, to if we have a desire, it's it's basically a cosmic desire. It's a desire of that cosmic intelligence that is just being reflected through our individuality. And so it gets the support of the cosmos rather than relying exclusively on the our little tiny individual efforts. Beautiful. I love it. And yes, this is exactly how I would describe it. It is the the desires that rise are supported by the cosmos because they're rising from the cosmos instead of exactly. this separate individual self coming up with some idea and then trying to go out and find support for it. The things that occur are the things that are destined to materialize and to manifest, and they become the desires because we're tapped into that. We're not losing that connection. So, uh, as such, it g- generates this sort of what I reference as this wave of grace that just moves through my life experience. And people marvel about it. I marvel about it at the same time that it happens so consistently in projects that I engage in every day. I'm in the middle of renovating a, a home that that I just moved into, and and people are showing up out of nowhere that have the skills or the the abilities and you know when when it's at a time where that's you know not uh, readily available um people are marveling that these things are happening in record time and with with record ease and they scratch their heads as as they walk past me in the hallway and it's like <laughs> i know <laughs> yeah it. yeah yeah support of nature yeah. another thing that happens which i think i heard you say something about is that Sometimes when things don't work out, it's actually to your advantage. Like today, I, I took a walk in the woods, and I, I spent 55 minutes making a recording to somebody who had had a, a spiritual awakening and was wondering what to do. And, um, and then the battery in my iPod died, and the recording wasn't saved. And so, you know, I thought, okay, well, there must be a reason for it. I'll make another one tomorrow. Um, and uh, I don't know. We don't want to start reading cosmic significance into every little thing that happens, but you do kind of after a while begin to trust the way things are orchestrated. Again, by that intelligence I was referring to, there's, you, you, you trust it because it, it proves itself, yes. you know, over and over again. Time and time again, time yeah. and time again. And the, the ease with which that allows life to unfold is tremendous. That, that you didn't get upset and that you didn't start in your mind thinking, you know, judging, oh, I should have charged it, I should have known it. All the things that people do in that moment, when you actually now know that the recording that you make tomorrow is going to have some element in it or some kind of angle to it that didn't come through today, that will come, on, that will come through tomorrow or whenever that recording does happen, that will be perfectly suited for whatever this individual is supposed to hear back from you. No question. Yeah. There's that movie with Tom Hanks, Bridge of Spies, and, and Tom Hanks is talking to this guy who was a spy, <clears throat> and he was saying to the guy's just ca- sitting there casually smoking a cigarette, and the gig is up for him. He's, he's been found out, and he could, and Tom Hanks is saying, you know, you could end up getting executed. Aren't you worried? And he takes a puff on his cigarette and says, would it help? <laughs> right. No amount of worry is going to get me out of this. <laughs> um, a couple of questions came in. Let's ask those, and then we'll use that as a way of shifting gears and talking more about the energy codes. Um, so one is from Rita in Melbourne, Australia. And she asks, um, she actually sent this in a few days ago, and she said, ask this of any guest who would like to answer. And I thought, well, ask Sue, because she's the next one up. Uh, She said, I understand this is a spiritually significant time right now. How can I harness, embrace, and further action further action, my connection with the universe, both consciously and subconsciously, in alignment in what I do every day. What changes can I expect to see, hear, feel? What evidence will I notice? I think that we are being gifted at this time with a tremendous, um, unique circumstance that humanity has been asked to evaluate, to go home, to sit down, 
to not do all the things that we normally do. There's a stillness before us that isn't typical. And in that, I feel that that this bandwidth of the mental self is softening, is poised in more curiosity rather than uh, being on autopilot. And so there's a, a presence and an availability. And how someone might capitalize on that is to just simply bring consciousness to the fact that there is a divine order to things and that what we are all collectively being invited to do right now is in service to that. And if we will allow that to be true for us on a personal level, then we are embracing what is occurring rather than being resistant to the fact that we have to do this or we have to do that or we can't do this or this is not happening right now. And instead of being in resistance to it, to embrace it fully, to to be curious about how is this serving. And even if the answer to the question doesn't come immediately, the fact that we're asking an open-ended question that is filled with possibility puts us in a vibrational frequency where this can serve us instead of us dialing into the frequency of frustration and fear or resistance or or resentment that we're unable to be as freely you know doing or going as we as we used to be we're being we're being called into another version of ourselves and if we allow that to, to be uh, the perfect right time and the and and accept that on a personal note I think that People will, and, and the students that I'm working with are definitely reporting this happening, that, that they're finding that they have a greater sense of presence and patience and that they're healing and that they're rejuvenating and that they have more energy available and they have more curiosity and creativity happening because they're actively uh, embracing. And there are so many things that happen in the course of a day to to remind us, oh, here's another opportunity to do that. Oh, here's another opportunity. If we, if we, you know, read the read the news or watch the news or hear something happening, it it's another opportunity that's constantly being um, elevated in, in on a conscious level for us to start to walk and talk completely differently. So by embracing it, number one, I think that it will dial you into a field of possibility and creativity and allow for rejuvenation, the way that we're speaking about this, of your own energies to be able to be focused now on something different than, than trying to strategize on how to deal with these difficult times, but, but rather just embrace them. Just assume that this is in your favor and that it's here for you. And by doing so, your, your, your translation of the energies happens very differently. And as such, your body physically has now more energy to work with. Uh, results of that or outcomes of, of being that way with it are definitely going to be uh, presenting things to you like what we're describing. You may even find that you're, you're cl closer in a divine nature to, to the true self or to nature itself or to a cosmic um, uh, relationship of sorts. That, that if we walk around recognizing that, wow, life is really different and this is happening in my favor and there's something here that is here for me that wasn't here for me a year ago, that that you, you begin to establish a rapport with something that used to feel out there and separate from you. And it's through that rapport and that relationship that we begin to actually be able to merge with it and become a bigger state of being because of this embracing and this trust and this faith that's, that's right up in our face uh, in a way that it wasn't you know, for the majority of our adult lives. So, so I'm hoping that that's helpful. I'm not sure that I tapped <laughs> into all aspects of the question. Um, I'll, I'll let no, you, you never can, read you that. never can get everything, but um, sure. that was good. But what about you know? I mean, things haven't in the sh the pandemic and the shutdown and all that probably haven't impacted you and I too adversely. Although you can't travel and do your your seminars, but, um, you know, you're doing okay, and I'm doing okay, doing what I do, I can do it from home, but what about the person who worked in or owned a restaurant, and the restaurant's been closed down, you know, and, and they're, they're out of money, and they've got kids to feed and everything, some people are really going through it right now, and, and they're also kind of on a forced retreat, in a way, uh, where people who aren't used to retreats 
begin to feel very uncomfortable because they're used to sort of, you know, doing stuff. Um, so how do you speak to those people? Sure. And my heart so goes out to individuals. I have dear friends that are that are in, you know, these types of circumstances. And, and in our conversations, what they are realizing is that for some of them, they're realizing that while they were doing what they were doing, and it was their source of income, it really wasn't their their choice of vocation, and that they're actually in a state of reevaluation and reinvention. And what I feel on a higher spiritual level is happening for them is that that forced reevaluation or that forced, you know, stymie of the system that was in flow uh, is is causing this squeeze up into a higher meaning of life and really looking to who I am, what matters most, and these energies of of searching and finding and reprioritizing and and uh, so many people have reported to me in, in conversation that that they're finding that they have a greater understanding of love and their value system is shifting and and they're they're while they're struggling with their finances they're also uh, recognizing that a reprioritization of what they thought they needed uh, is happening and so if someone you know, if someone is on a spiritual path and they find themselves living in an ashram or they find themselves wanting to to seclude themselves or to even relinquish a lot of their worldly goods because of the energetic that that consumes and that suddenly they're being drawn into this centeredness and this this alignment with their true divine nature. Those things are happening voluntarily for someone who's seeking on the path. And and what's happening are those same sets of circumstances in mass for humanity. And while we're meeting it with confusion and frustration and, you know, an inherent resistance of, in a sense of survivorhood, um, it ultimately might be drawing them into that same vertical alignment that ultimately in the course of their life will be a necessity. It is a necessity for each of us. Sometimes it doesn't happen until the days that we are in, uh, you know, bedridden, that we are in hospice, or that we are in, you know, serious contemplation of of who we are and our our moments left here on earth. That sort of arrangement and alignment is is trying to happen, and there's a a sense of uh, desperation about it. Uh, oftentimes causing a lot of fear in the midst of one's transition out of the physical dimension and, and into the spiritual realms, you know, in, involved in that cycling that we were speaking of earlier in our conversation. And so what if right now it's breaking the seal on what we thought life was and causing us to do some of those evaluations and meet with some of that discomfort now so that as this starts to open up again, we are aware and awake to parts of ourselves that that no other set of circumstances may have generated the awareness of. And so as we go through the rest of our lives, a greater sense of self and this awareness is included in all of our decisions and our actions that we are taking moving forward. And so as we uh, near the end of our life experience here, we already have a greater sense of self as if we'd been on a, a deep spiritual path um, by, by uh, choice. It seemingly put us there not by choice, but at some level it accomplished what what we are here to accomplish and awaken to uh, in this realm, which is who we are, what is true, what matters most, while we're here on this frontier of consciousness called the third dimension in a physical form. You know, now that might not speak to okay on a daily basis. Here's what you do, uh, and I I do speak to that, but just trying to 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 give some kind of context for people who are confused and, and afraid and really dealing with it on a on a challenged level right now that there might be a really high level of support happening here that is something that might not have met the eye under any other set of circumstances yeah so in other words it may be that the whole world is going through a kind of a phase transition or a reshuffling that is um similar to that which an individual may undergo as they're transitioning into a higher state of 
consciousness or a higher state of being. There was a, um, I once heard a chemist speak at a conference named Ilya, Ilya Prigogine. He won the Nobel Prize in chemistry, and he talked about how in the transition from one state to another, there's often a, a sort of a turbulent period uh, where everything, and we can think of the example of caterfly, caterpillar to butterfly, where it turns to mush, and then the, yeah. the imaginal cells form it into a butterfly. So there's often a kind of a breakdown of familiar or comfortable structures that's apparently necessary as a transition takes place. I mean, look at you. You had that big experience, and then you were flat on your back for at least a week and couldn't function and had to gradually relearn to function. But when you did so, you were functioning on a, in a whole different way. Yes. Um, so, or, you know, so maybe that's happening to the world right now, and that might give a more positive perspective on what is otherwise a dire situation. I do feel that it is. I do. F- I inherently feel that this is a good thing that we are having to reimagine ourselves, that it is up leveling the amount of animated creative source energy inside of the bandwidth of human consciousness, that we are animating creativity and and presence. We're having to rethink things. We're, we're here. We're plugged in in a way that autopilot wasn't doing a year, a year and a half ago. You know, as as this was starting to to come down, you know, people were immediately having to respond. And then after a few months, they were having to, okay, I got to get busy. I got to figure this out, how to re-engage and then after a few months, really readjust that and deal with emotional issues that, that are, you know, surfacing because of frustrations and fears and, and recognizing how, how regularly we depend on thinking that we know what's coming. You know, we depended on that assumption. And, and clearly we didn't, we didn't know. We just thought we did. But, but we rode on that thinking that we knew what to anticipate each day to some degree, um, and it freed us up. So I feel that it's cultivating a deeper level of faith and trust, and and ultimately I feel like that is acclimating us, introducing us to and acclimating us to the invisible realm. Who am I when I can't do the things that I'm used to doing? When I don't get to show up in the world the way I'm used to showing up, then who am I really? And what else is here in this world behind the scenes that that I might be able to start to to activate and work with, um, you know, to put that into some tangible terms. I've been working with people who have been like hidden, secluded, uh, secretly empathic all their lives that now they're able to come out and work with these energies because it's it's accessible. They're not doing all the things that they were doing before. They're, they have time, they have space, they have energy, um, and they have awareness to tap into these. I'm working with people and in, in sharing with them how to become not only he, the healers that they are, but to work with people remotely because we've been forced to work with people remotely. And so people are tapping into talents and gifts that they never knew they had um, and, and likely wouldn't have pursued it um, given the um, the pace that humanity was in, and and so so many gifts are being revealed in this invisible behind the scenes higher states of consciousness um, a- aspects of every human being on the planet to some degree or another, and just like everything else, the the degree to which we embrace it and become curious about it is the the degree to which it will serve us, and the degree to which we resist it and clamp, you know, down and contract in the face of it uh, is the degree to which we will suffer, and not to say that, you know, my business went away and and I, I, I own a restaurant that I can't, you know, bring people to, and so I'm not, you know, the funds just simply aren't there, and I'm losing Losing that, that is that is a very real and tangible thing. But if we could say, okay, you know, it, that, that, what if that was serving me? What would that look like? What if it was good? Then how would I start processing everything that I'm processing? How would I, you know, what emotions would rise up in me? What energies would I feel inside my system any differently than than how I was feeling it when I'm just in the shock and in the resistance and in the emotional, you know, uh, upheaval, and then therefore perhaps even anxiousness or or depression. 
because of it, if I were to change my perception on it, might I also change my experience and the, the degree to which I can benefit from this reinvention time. Last week, um, I interviewed three guys who have a podcast called Conspirituality. And um, one of the things we discussed is that in other pandemic times and in times of great social upheaval and economic collapse and things like that, conspiracy, conspiracy theories just seem to go wild, um, as if people are grasping it at means of understanding what in the heck is going on in their world. And this is happening now, obviously, and, um, you know, there are people who say the virus is a hoax or that uh, we, we don't even have to go into them all, um, but... Do you have any thoughts on this? It, it, actually, the spiritual community, which is why this word spirituality was coined, seems particularly susceptible to it. Uh, there are, I, I have friends in Sedona who say that maybe three quarters of the people of, of the new agey types there are into QAnon or something related to it. So do you have any insights about this phenomenon, which I find rather baffling and disturbing? Yes, you know, Rick, I think it comes down to the basic human dilemma I think that ultimately we are here to choose. We are here to create. And ultimately, we are here to determine what the nature of our presence here will be. We're here to choose that and create it. And so as, as circumstances rise and the pressure is up and uh, the, the intensity is upon us, uh, we again are at choice. So whether it is a hoax or is real, whether it is man-made or natural, whether it is intended for this purpose or that purpose, the bottom line is, who will you choose to be? Given your circumstances that you are actually experiencing each day, who will you choose to be? How will you choose to utilize your energies? What amount of love and presence and good intention, what a degree of action will you place upon those qualities that you are being, that you are breathing, that you are bringing? What degree of action and what ways will you express? Will you maintain your identity as a presence that is completely capable of processing everything that is before you? Because ultimately, as we said earlier in this conversation, you're made of the universe. There's not a single thing that you are not. You are that compressed into a body, and you are that waking up. You're bringing conscious awareness to all of those vibrational frequencies. So there is nothing out here that is bigger than you unless you choose to only identify as a fraction of who you actually are. When we become identified as the protective personality or the false self or the egoic you know, individual that needs to, to guard or fight against in order to have, then, then we, are, we are subjecting ourselves to the world of duality where we really have to you know, put up our dukes and be strong and fight back. And, and if we can teach our minds to recognize the greatness, the, mag the magnificence of our being, then we can walk in a state of transmutation, walk in a state of flourishing abundance, no matter what our external circumstances are. And so, you know, that's what we're here to do, is to master the internal reality, regardless of external circumstances. We're here to bring the absolute. We're not here to find it. We're here to reveal it. And because we're not clear on that, we get really caught up in, is it this or is it that? Is it this or is it that? And in reality, I think the answer is yes. It is this and it is that. And who are you going to choose to be in the face of all of those possibilities? And so, so whether it's conspiracy and whether it's true, whether it's real, whether it's induced or whether it's, you know, just because we've, we've made, you know, we've, we've medicated ourselves to the degree that the bugs that are surviving are super bugs, uh, we have to realize that, that there is also an evolution of human consciousness at that same time. And we have the potential to transmute anything if we will um, teach ourselves, if we will we'll organize and integrate and embody and, uh, and root and ground, as we were speaking earlier, then our capacity elevates. And as our capacity elevates, we are capable of uh, transmuting this current situation. So, this is a long answer to, to uh, a short question, but, but it is, I think, ultimately, it boils down to, 
it's our choice and it's and they're just up the, the game is being upped because we're up for the game being upped and uh and and here we are at a choice point hmm. i want to give you time to talk about the energy codes but a, a few more questions have come in do you want to just talk about the energy codes or do you want me to ask the questions and maybe you can kind of sure. weave in some energy code stuff Definitely. to the answers let's, for let's these take questions. The questions for sure all right um, so here's one from Wesley in Oregon. He asks, I have, I have heard the idea that, and often felt that certain mantras and prayers, like, for example, the Gayatri mantra or say the Lord's Prayer, that these common sacred chants carry the charge of the whole collective energy of the countless times they've been spoken throughout time, that in chanting them, one is plugged into and adding to the power of that accumulated field energy. Any thoughts on that, Sue? I definitely concur with that. I also think that that is not the only reason that they carry the power that they carry. I think that the root power that they carry is the vibrational frequency and intonation and what is activated in the system by letting them move through our individual uh, bodies in, in vibrational frequency. We're made of light and we're compressed together into a physical body. And on the way to that, sound is, is generated in that compressive state. And so the sounds of the Gayatri Mantra, for instance, are sounds that activate different vibrational frequencies throughout our whole system. And as we repeat those tones, we become actively enlivened by the toning, and levels of our consciousness are enlivened. And, of course, in the bandwidth of human consciousness that we are all tapping into, the more that something is held as true at the conscious level uh, through the repetition over the years, over the ages, uh, it, of course, enhances that in the very vibrations that we're walking through inside of this bandwidth that we share. So, so it was originally phenomenally uh, profound, and it has only been enhanced because it has been held as sacred because of what it is uh, since the beginning of uh, this this recording. Yeah, yeah. It's also said that these mantras um, and the bija mantras that are often taught um, actually are just sort of the if if a mantra is, can be chanted out loud or thought in the mind, then there are actually subtler levels of that mantra as well. And at the very subtlest level, it's said that these powerful mantras actually are aligned with, one would say, uh, with deep impulses of intelligence that are very fundamental to nature. We could call them gods or devas um, in, the, in that terminology, but that using the mantra actually creates a collaborative sort of relationship with that God or that impulse of intelligence. We help them in some way, they help us, and, um, you know, it, everybody's happy. <laughs> yes, a resonance, a coherence, and yeah. ultimately an awakening. I also feel that we, we do merge with that frequency, so it doesn't remain a me and a them that is helping me. It is then a we, and then it is an I, uh, that I am that as well. But, but I can't get there with my egoic mind, with my, with my material-based consciousness. I can only get there as a vibrational coherence. I can only get there as a vibrational resonance when, when, uh, when I allow my thinking mind to soften into the heart space and to allow these tones to be spoken, then I'm activating that uh, for the greater self. Good. Martin from Germany asks, if the inner state is manifesting in the outer world and my anger or even rage of being treated with injustice and humiliation is creating resistance and back anger in my opposites, I think he means, you know, he, he gets angry and then it comes back to him. How do I change that? Uh, do I have to love my enemies? And how would I do that? Or do I have to let them humiliate me and be submissive? In other words, how do I turn the situation around from the inside out? Yes, well, you said it in the last part of your question. It is from the inside out. So loving your enemies is uh, a wonderful thing to do, but your enemies are only a reflection of you. So, so they are the reflection of that. You know, science is showing us that we're just projecting our self onto a movie screen and then we're engaging with the self. And it is in, through that that we're then able to come to know what's going on in here. That I have enemies is a reflection of the fact that I internally am not embracing all aspects of the self. 
So self-love is, uh, and, and to stay on the self and to, to truly be loving uh, into the self or as the self, even more accurately, then what happens is in, the idea of enemies disappears when there is enough self-love happening. When there is enough self-love happening, we emanate and radiate a different movie, and we look into these people, and we see them not quite as the enemy that they were before, but perhaps a teacher or perhaps a, a reference point for me to, to glean uh, feedback on how I'm doing at the game of self-love. If, if I'm constantly bumping into friction and resistance and people that are mean or that, that are, you know, not, not acting in love, then it, if, if that is an outpicturing of what's going on in here, it simply means there are parts of me that I haven't embraced yet. There are parts of me that I'm not loving into. There are self-judgments and, and compartmentalizations that I've generated, and they are reflecting that back to me. And as I focus on changing this from the inside out, like take your attention off the enemies for a bit and utilize that as, man, if if that degree of unlove or non-love is coming at me, it's coming from me. And so maybe I'm not mean to them, but maybe I'm not so nice to me, just to put it simply. And so start loving into those parts of the self that have gotten, you know, abandoned and have gotten thrown under the bus along the way and and start reclaiming them and calling them back and getting to know them and and breathing into them with with compassion and uh, and uh, and beginning again anew and what will happen is you will see that when you look out to these enemies they don't look quite so um, so uh, distorted any longer that there's there's a, a refinement that's happening in the field which allows you to to have a different engagement there. Yeah. Okay, this next question I think will help us segue into more about the energy codes. This is from Cameron in San Marcos, California. How important is practice in the experience of true nature? Beautiful. Well, you know, it's it's not that we have to practice to to relate to true nature. It is that we have to practice not separating ourselves from true nature. We have to practice stopping that. So practices, in my, in my estimation, are designed to teach us how to undo what we landed here and began doing as a means of survivorship, not knowing who we were while we, in the years that we were formulating our orientation here on this planet. You know, we kind of land and splat, and our mind goes one way and our body goes another, and, you know, our consciousness is kind of hanging out to see if it's ever going to be safe to drop into the river fully. And, uh, and so, so practices are how to gather ourselves again so that we know that mind and body and spirit breath are, are really unified. They're really one thing. And as such, we come to know ourselves as nature again. So we're awakening to true nature by using practices that will call us back home again. As the mind is is splatted out here, oriented to the external world, and through pratyahara, ret- retracting our senses back inwardly, we, we can come to sense and feel and perceive the self in ways that we just never, we never can uh, orchestrate that kind of understanding when our attention is externally oriented. So, so techniques, practices, regularity, systemized way of coming back onto the self, all that it is doing is allowing you to discover the nature, the true nature that, that you are, that your mind alone never got to experience because it is only a certain fraction of energetic bandwidths and it's not the whole. And when we are identified as the mind, we don't feel complete, and we never will, because we're not if we're identified as the mind. So what we're doing is peeling ourselves off of the mind, coming back onto the self, realizing we have a mind that's to serve us. Instead of you know it controlling the show, we have to get it in its proper role. And, uh, and so practices are what allow that to happen in a consistent enough fashion that enough of the photons and then activating the sensory nervous system and then this perception of self can happen in a consistent fashion that we don't forget. We don't just have an aha moment and then two minutes later, you know, be upset at the guy who cut us off in traffic, you know, thinking that it's the end of the world. So, yeah. So, um, 
couple of things I want to hear you talk about more. One is the bus stop conversation. You can explain what that is. And then, uh, you know, let's say someone reads this book or eventually, you know, gets, go, gets to go to seminars or workshops that you teach. What are they actually going to learn? So let's cover both of those things if we could. Sure. So um, the, the bus stop conversation is similar to what might, might, might click in for someone easily to, to reference it as a, a soul contracts kind of idea where we have an arrangement that, that I'm going to help you refine something and you're going to help me refine something while we come into this, um, this realm, in these bodies and live this life. So I used to describe it as a council conversation, a council of angels getting ready to come to earth. You know, we play out the roles, figure out what's, who's going to help who with what, and then we come and we forget that we had that conversation and we figure it out when we come. And, uh, and then I found myself speaking at, at business conferences and medical communities where councils of angel type conversations weren't going to fly. And so uh, I just tossed it out one day as this, okay, just imagine that you're going to the bus stop to catch the bus to come to earth. And, uh, and while you're there, um, you strike up a conversation at others at the bus stop and and you ask them you know what are you going to experience when you go in and and the other person you know does the same and somebody says well i don't know i've never been and somebody else raises their hand and says oh been there before crazy place um super wild last time i left i i accidentally like coincidentally did this thing that they call forgiveness and um and, and it felt so amazing that all this energy just rushed through me and I let go of all these things that I was carrying around forever and boom, you know, I just had this amazing revelation and then, you know, it was over because I was on my way out. Uh, so I'm going back and I'm going to do that again, but I'm going to do it sooner and I'm going to do it bigger. So I'm going back for a level 10 forgiveness and, uh, and I can't wait because what I felt was amazing. It's going to be tenfold of that. So another person at the bus stop is like, wow, sounds great. How are you going to do that? The person says, well, I guess I'm going to have to, I don't know, experience something that's nearly unforgivable. And then I'm going to live with that and be angry about that and be frustrated and compress it inside myself, get down the road, start feeling the physical effects of that. You know, my, my health is going to decline. I'm going to live this contracted, compressed life. And at some point, I'm going to get sick and tired of being that way. I'm going to reach inside myself and I'm going to find some part of me that I didn't even know I had some depth, in-depth level of forgiveness, reach up and express it out there. And I'm going to have this, this, this huge experience of forgiveness and uh, get to know a, a part of myself that I, I never would have known. And so, you know, the other people at the bus stop are like, whoa, sounds amazing. Um, you know, how, how, how can we help? And the person says, well, somebody's going to have to do something that's nearly unforgivable. Like, you know, drink too much at happy hour, get behind the wheel, cross the center line, hit my car, take my loved ones, cripple me, you know, these kinds of things that could have been avoided. It has to be just, you know, just completely wrong, wrong of wrongs. And, uh, and so, you know, who will help me? And, you know, everybody's like, not me. I don't want to be that guy. You know, who wants to be that guy? And, and so then the conversation, you know, goes on and it's like, really, come on. I, I bought my bus ticket and I, here I am. This is my chance. You know, don't, don't leave me out. And so somebody, finally, the back of the place, raises their hand and says, okay, I can see how much this means to you. I'll be the one. I'll be the one that is the perpetrator, the one that, that does these, these nearly unforgivable things. So that can be translated in many ways in many different people's lives. And invariably, when I share this, whether I'm doing an online teaching, in a, you know, in which, which I'm doing now, uh, or when we were in the rooms together, invariably people crying and recognizing, oh my God, that, you know, the, the person who abused me or the person who abandoned me actually was the one who, you know, finally raised their hand and, and helped me deliver or helped deliver this scenario for me that is going to allow me to reach inside and find maybe a level 10 self-love that I never would have found had I not been up against the adverse circumstances, the friction that was created from, from that dynamic. Or, you know, Which what, is not to say that an abuser can say, I'm doing this for your own good. Yeah, no, no. So it is and not that we ask for it in that way. And ultimately, that abuser is going to have to uh, take uh, take inventory on what they came here to learn. So it might be self-forgiveness. It might be, you know, redemption. It might be something along those same lines that they will have to come to terms, whether it's now or whether it's blink, blink, 
a few lifetimes later, it does resolve because that is the way the universe works. It does abhor a vacuum. It wants to fill it. It wants flow and unity. So these kinds of concentrated energies that are unresolved cannot maintain themselves. And so we're here to resolve them consciously on this spiritual path so that we don't have to pay it out karmically in some kind of unconscious manner. Uh, we can dissolve that right here with our own awareness and intention. So the bus stop conversation is to allow this understanding on more of a personal note that that there is purpose that, that nothing is bigger than us that we managed it that we requested it so that we could awaken ourselves in certain ways that we are bigger than these individual circumstances that we are facing in this life hmm. patanjali said uh, avert the danger which has not yet come which means if you can work it all out within yourself so that you don't have to work it out karmically as you just said yes yes beautiful all right, let's talk about the energy code some more. Tell us what this is all about. Certainly. Well, we've kind of been talking about the energy code. We, we kind of oh. have been, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the book is filled with principles and practices. And so the principles we've been tapping into uh, in, in large proportion in our conversation, and the practices are how do you start to do that? How do you come on to the self instead of being splatted and dispersed? And how do you find ways to build the circuitry to perceive a greater sense of self rather than being caught up in our survivorship and our knee-jerk reactions and the patterns and the habits that we've established and, and even a sense of self that we've orchestrated over the course of our lives? How do we find that greater self? And and so it's a, it's a series of practices that use breath work and use uh, the conscious and the subconscious mind and memory and and uh, nerve uh, patterning, developing synapses in the brain and in the body that allow for circuits to be built to sustain a greater sense of healing and filtering and cleansing rather than the, the defensive, protective, guarded portions of the nervous system and, uh, and so forth. So I talk about body chemistry in very user-friendly terms that people can implement, you know, lifestyles that, that generate an alkaline environment so that our immune and our robust vitality is present and I also have a you know a large emphasis there on on how to really understand how to work with the individual circumstances that are happening in your life and and how to allow the body to serve the mind's attempt to understand and to translate that billions of bits of information bombard us every millisecond, this energy field that we are, and they land at the gut. They don't land at our head. And then they rise up through the brain in our gut and are filtered through the brain in our heart. And then they rise up to the brain in our head so that by then we've, they've been translated into images and ideas and perceptions that are serving our lives here. Um, and if we're not living in our bodies, if we're just living in our heads, then we then we overthink and we don't use the body to help us filter and translate these energies. And so we don't know what to do with them. And we become anxious and, you know, um, and overthink and overpredict and and uh, analytical in ways that aren't serving us the way that we've been speaking about it today. And so, for instance, uh, a, a, a real um, tangible and valuable technique that, that people learn right away is how to breathe up and down through the shashumna, this central channel in the body, and how to anchor ourselves in the body while we're learning to enliven this. It's a great integrator. It is what activates this integrative energy that allows us to not only be loving, but be loving and powerful. Not only be loving and powerful, but also be wise and creative and, and strong and, and spiritual spiritual and uh, capable all at the same time, that we don't have to be either powerful or spiritual or either powerful or loving, it, that we, we can have all of that. We are made of all of that, and we want to be able to access all of it all the time, whenever it is appropriate. So, so that central channel breathing and then breathing for each of the energy centers and the levels of consciousness that are associated with them to enliven them specifically is, is a, a, a fantastic piece of it. And what I really love about it is that we start working with energy instead of story. We start working with the energy instead of the thinking mind. So if someone walks in the room and, and upsets you, instead of saying, why do you do that? Or why do I get so upset when you do that? Either of which is kind of an unanswerable question if we're asking it. We haven't been able to find the answer to it. But to take people's attention to the body 
and to realize that that your system is going to tell you exactly why that's happening if you let the body speak. So we learn a language of the body that if you have a knot in your stomach, it means something different than if you get a lump in your throat or different than if you have uh, tightness in your chest. I, I just realized I have an, an image here that I use when I'm teaching often that there is a this flow of energy comes down through the body, hits the earth, rises up again, gets transmuted for human consumption, rises up again, and this energy actually is you. It is an energy that runs through your body. It is you. You descend to the earth, you rise, and you rise as high as you can go, and then you cycle back around, and that's actually what creates the physical body. It's a byproduct of regular energy flow. And so if we allow it to ascend with the same purity as it descends, um, no problems. We live in this perfected field and all is well. But most of us are living in a state something like this. So we rise and there are areas of our consciousness that have developed and areas that are still sleeping. And so this path of least resistance is what happens and we rise in this kind of wobbly sort of way and it causes a distortion in the biofield. Uh, it causes a distortion in this flow. And now this individual is looking out through a distorted field. So we see people that don't care and lives that don't have, have opportunity and, that, and we just see in an obstructed manner because we're looking through a distorted field. So what we're doing with the energy codes is, is working on building circuits here instead of these gaps that we're circumventing along the way. So when you have a knot in your stomach, it's because this energy is hitting right there. And, and then it has to go around it, etc. If you have tightness in your chest, the energy is hitting there. If you have a lump in your throat, the energy is hitting there, and it's, and it's working its way around. So if when someone comes into the room, you have a charge against, you know, with something that they're doing, the reason you have a charge on it is because you haven't really awakened to all that you are. And so you're running on these, these compensatory pathways. And so that is appearing to be a threat when actually if all of your circuits were animated and activated, you wouldn't see it as a threat at all. You would see it completely differently. Same person, same words, same actions, different effect. So we're working on let's build the circuits so that we are sitting here in this perfected system that is constantly reinventing itself and, and so forth. So the way that we do that is when somebody walks in the room, if you have a charge and it affects you in your gut differently than in your throat or in your chest, you squeeze it back wherever it is. You squeeze it back. You hug it on the inside. And then you continue breathing as in the ways that I'm teaching in the book or that I teach in the coursework and, and include it in this central channel breath. Meanwhile, you're anchoring yourself in the body so that you don't, you know, just become so expansive and airy-fairy like you were mentioning earlier, that if we don't root and we don't ground, then we, and if we expand, then we have a hard time functioning. So the majority of the interest is on let's ground, let's integrate, let's embody, and now let's find where are these gaps in our awareness that we could flood the energy to bring our consciousness into and start breathing it awake. Because what happens is the layers of consciousness that comprise the levels of the body, the chakra system, etc., are there just waiting to be animated. But perhaps we're not aware that we haven't animated them. So the body is constantly trying to tell the mind where we're living and where we're not. If it's stiff, we're not living in there. If it's in pain, we're not living in there. If it is, you know, creating these reactive areas when circumstances happen in our lives, again, these are areas that have not yet become animated inside of our, the system of wholeness that we are. So instead of getting up into our heads and asking the story to provide answers, we take our attention to the body and let the body tell the mind, Here's why. Here's why you have a reaction to that. It's because your power center is not even animated. You're not even active there. You're circumventing that every chance you get because of a pattern, a pathway that was established early on in your life. You went to the bus stop. You created conversations that would bring people into your life to challenge that so that you ultimately would find that you really need to do some work right here. How do you know? Because you got this knot in your stomach all the time. So, so it teaches you how to deal with what you're feeling in the body. Instead of trying to heal issues in the body, you're realizing that the body has just been trying to tell the mind all along where we needed to work with our consciousness as a team more readily, more consistently, sooner. 
And so it allows us to begin doing that, in trusting that the body is just revealing a language of the soul that the mind alone couldn't interpret. So I approach it like the soul speaks to the body and the body speaks to the mind. And if we would, and the mind doesn't listen, the mind's busy writing stories. So if we just direct the mind to the body, now we can start to learn at the mind level, the level of the mind, this, this language of the soul, which will allow mind and body and breath to, to integrate into this soulful self and live the life that we're seeking to live. That's great. Let me hit you with about four short questions and have you answer them all at once. So um, let's say a person had been doing, learn the energy codes, they've been doing it for about a year. Um, what does their daily routine look like? And uh, what kind of benefit would you expect the average person to have achieved um, in your experience? And also, um, what is your retention rate? How many people, and related to that, uh, do most people say, yeah, I can do this? Or do some people say, it's too difficult, it's too complicated, things like that? Beautiful. So... A regular routine is somebody is walking around, they've learned how to uh, have one eye on the inside and one eye on the path, that they're constantly listening to the, the, the activations that the body is generating, and they're constantly working with, with uh, flowing and energy through those areas, and they're finding a greater relief in, in their lives from a mental and emotional standpoint, so anxiety and a greater sense of well-being. Physical things heal. I healed migraine headaches and a scoliosis in my in my system, which is what you know got my attention to the degree that I started working with patients even more so with it and clients and and so. Uh, yeah, that was really it, interesting about your scoliosis. You'd wake up in the middle of the night, your body would be contorted into some strange position, but it was like your body was actually readjusting itself. That, it that was. was cool. When my mind was asleep and out of the way, the body yeah. was starting to unwind and and heal. And so people who are working and walking with this, with these techniques, um, are finding similar things. I get reports often that, that they're waking up in the middle of the night. This nighttime yoga, I think, is how it's referenced in, in the book, uh, that they're in these different, uh, different contortions because they're breathing in this central channel. Uh, I have several students that have been working with this now for seven, eight, nine years, ten years, that are that are uh, reporting all kinds of things changing, relationships changing, their, their ability to ask for what they want and need, their ability to realize that they don't need the outer world to deliver these things, but that they have it, uh, finding this abundance within, finding a greater appreciation for who they are in the world and having confidence to speak their truths and, and to be out in the world in a way that, that they were feeling um, you know, confined from or separate from and in so many beautiful ways. I was just just reading some cards this morning, just tears in my eyes, just reading what's happening in people's lives that, that have just come in just since the pandemic and what they're experiencing and being so grateful for finding ways to deal with this just by grounding and integrating in these ways. Um, so I don't, let's see what was the other question. So what's the, yeah. So whether it's easy for people, what kind of oh, benefits they typically would experience after a year, what and what your attrition rate is, if you know. Yeah. yeah. So you know, I'm finding that initially people people uh, are very attracted to the ideas and like things like the bus stop conversation and the other principles that I'm bringing in and learning how to breathe in the belly and central channel breathing and then learning simple things like this mula bandha, which is locking ourselves in at the root of the spine and in, in anchoring at the, the backside of the heart chakra and that they're, they're immediately feeling a greater sense of self and presence. They feel that immediately. And then they begin to, to realize that they can apply it in all these different life situations uh, where they're, they're not reacting emotionally, but they're, they're knowing the practices that they can do in an instant. And one of the things I love about it and that people report that they love about it is that the energy codes don't require you to, to sit and do practices for an hour a day or half an hour a day. They're meant to do while you're living your life. That, that they're meant for that because life is showing you where and how and which ones to implement at any given moment. 
because I developed them while I was living my life, while I was trying to learn to get back out into the world with this higher state of consciousness and this you know, newfound vibration. It was embodiment that allowed me to do that. So I've just kind of retro-engineered it and I'm teaching people how to expand their consciousness in the same way that I took this expansive consciousness and climbed into my body. We can open those same doorways to come up and out in a more expansive way, but always remaining tethered you know, in the physical world so that these expanded you know, realms can benefit us while we're here in this life. So, so people stick, they stay, they love it. And, um, and, and, and sometimes people come back that thought that it was too complicated or that they couldn't. It, it really isn't complicated. Once they start doing these four anchor points and central channel breathing, it's home free. And so it's just about finding yourself living inside this elevator shaft inside the body. And oftentimes, people who haven't been meditating or haven't been doing breath work or that type of thing think, you know, wow, what? But then it lands for them and they get it. And the moment that that happens, they're living in a different world. So, Could people learn it entirely from the book or is it kind of necessary to have a seminar of some kind? You know, I, I wanted to write the book that it was self-contained that it definitely doesn't hold everything that I teach in the seminars, by far. For instance, I teach about chakras 1 through 7 in the book, and in the courses I go to 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, and I start talking about concepts that I felt were too much to put in an introductory book. I'll write another book that carries more of that content, but I had to know that this foundational information was out there, in this book form, that people could read and follow it from cover to cover and have a self-contained body of work that would be full and, and complete in its own way. I didn't want to just write a teaser to make people do something else. So somebody could read this book and, and, and have a, a treasure trove of information that will serve them for their lifetime. And if they want to know more and they, they get inspired and, and, and are enthusiastic about it, there is a lot of coursework that is available that has all invented itself. I didn't sit down and say, I want to teach six different levels of coursework, and I'm going to teach this and this and this and this and the first one and then this and this. It, it just I taught the first one, and people were like, we want to do this again. So we did it again. And I taught it again. And then they were like, well, what else do you know? And so I was like, <laughs> okay, let's have a level two. <laughs> and then we taught level two and they're like, okay, what's next? And then it became, you know, so, so creatively uh, level three. And, and it just birthed itself that way, just totally as supply and demand, what people wanted to know and what I felt was beneficial and what I was finding was helping my patients uh, change their lives. So, so it is, uh, it, there is, the book is self-contained and there is so much more if it is a path and a way of living that somebody wants to know how to implement and, and activate in, in, in additional ways. That is certainly available as well. Hmm. So how long have you been teaching it now? Uh, about 15 years. Wow. That and, and the book was a bestseller in various ways. So you have any idea how many people have learned it? I, I don't. I don't. I know that we've exposed it to probably, um, I think that we've added it up that because I also now teach people to teach the work. Right. And so we're estimating in our facilitators and our practitioners that are out there that, that we've, we've taught probably close to about a million people that wow. have actually learned the work itself. Um, and, you know, we're just getting started as far as exposing and really really wanting to ground humanity, because uh, these are times that this work was built for. I know that that's why this awakening happened with me when it did, and that I'm here at this time and, you know, doing my thing, um, that it's, it is, it feels like it's time is right now. Like, I feel like I've waited my whole life to, not that I was waiting, but that right now is what it's for. And, um, and that it's, it's so, accessible and understandable and per, and, integ and so easily integrated by people now. Things that I used to have to explain for 45 minutes, you know, in four minutes, people are like, got it. It's like, awesome, let's go to what's next. So what I'm finding even since the pandemic and teaching these courses online is that I'm rolling information forward and able to share with them faster because 
this collective is like, we're on it. We're ready. So I'm guessing that's, that's why it's happening. Nice. Well, as I said in the beginning, you know, it's one thing to have a spiritual awakening, but it, and a lot of people have them, but it's another thing to be able to translate it into something that can help others have one or help others, you know, grow in certain ways. So you, yeah. you obviously, as you said, were kind of destined for this or made for this. And obviously, it comes naturally to you, and uh, I think it's great. It's my greatest joy, and I have to say that this interview has been absolutely blissful for me now oh, thank you it's probably one of the best interviews i've ever had so thank well, thanks. you for the questions I'm if feeling I, you know, bliss, like, pretty blissful myself <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh i've always said it's relative to the quality of the questions and who's interviewing you like what you get to share and uh and so thank you very much for who you are and what you're doing and and how you are serving humanity oh you're welcome thank you um maybe we'll do another one when you're on level 20 or something oh my <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let me just show your website. I'm showing your website on the screen right now. It's um, Dr. Sue, Dr. Dr. Mortar, Dr. Sue Mortar dot com, right? Yes. You know, so people know what to do. They can just go there and hop over to your website and see what you have to offer. I'm sure you have some email lists and there's various. I, I notice there's a free meditation there, and um, so people will just explore that if they're interested. Oh, thank you so much. It's been my great pleasure. Indeed. Yeah. And uh, let me just say that next week I'll be interviewing uh, David Lorimer. And David has a, had a distinguished career. And among other things, he's the head of something called the Galileo Commission. And it's named that because Galileo couldn't get the church authorities to look through his telescope to see the rings of Saturn or whatever, which coincidentally are actually showing on my screen right now. That's an interesting thing. I have these, all these outer space pictures that just rotate on my, as my desktop picture, and there's the rings uh -huh. of Saturn. But in any case, uh, you know, he couldn't get them to look at it. So they, they put him under house arrest and threatened to torture him and all this stuff um, because he was suggesting that the... Um, Sun was the center of the solar system and not the Earth, and that was heresy. Um, so there's a, a sort of a materialist paradigm that dominates science these days, and, and scientists are, many of them are quite threatened by the notion that consciousness may be fundamental and not merely some epiphenomenon of brain functioning. So um, the, the Galileo Foundation talks about this stuff and has all kinds of seminars and courses and whatnot, which Beautiful. I think is very interesting. So that'll be next week. Indeed. Sounds fantastic. <laughs> Oops, Saturn's gone. Now I'm looking at some nebulae. All right. <laughs> well, thanks, Sue. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you so yeah. much. You're welcome. Talk to you later. Okay.